Thanks, John. Good afternoon. Um, it's really a pleasure to be here and uh, fascinating discussion so far from the first keynote and the uh, uh, talk we have after that and the session before this one, the panel before this one. So I'm, uh, I hope that you enjoyed them as much as I did, um, especially the critical material session. This is really very important for what we're talking about today. Um, our session is in solid state lightning, lighting and uh, will address important issues in our pursuit for energy efficiency. I think John Bowers in one of his talks and, and in the pamphlet that you get when you registered talked about lightning consumes 22% of all the US electricity, a very large number. And uh, the Department of Energy estimates that widespread adoption of LEDs can save us a lot. I was really impressed when I saw the number 46% if we can do it. I personally was very fortunate to see the very first white paper that was written in the late 80s by two visionary people at Hewlett Packard at that time, Roland Heights and Fred Kish. They wrote a white paper and I reviewed it for them that talked about solid state lighting. And it was very early, many people did not take them seriously, uh, but they really proved right in their vision. It's taking a little longer, but it's happening. And we'll, today we'll find out about the opportunities and the challenges that we are uh, facing in this area. So again, impressive performance. And uh, today I have the pleasure to have four panelists with me um, in the same order that we'll give the presentation. Uh, we'll start with uh, Jim Ebbetson. He is from Cree, a large company in solid state lighting. Next to him is Mike Krams, the CTO of a smaller but growing company, Sora, also in solid state lighting. And then Kelly Gordon from a national laboratory. She's a program manager at uh, Pacific Northwest National Lab. And finally, you have Steve Denbers from Academia who will talk to us about the future. So it's a good representation of a small, large industry, national labs and academia. You can see, read the biography uh, of the four distinguished members here. I'm not going to go through that, but each one of them have, has 10 minutes to give his presentation and her presentation, and then we'll leave 30 minutes for discussion and I encourage you to write your questions. And I would recommend, if you have a question, please line up between those two microphones, much easier than uh, passing the microphones. Okay, so we'll start with James. Uh, thank you, and thank you for inviting me and giving me a chance to talk to you today. Uh, I'm going to give sort of a, you know, Cree is a, a big, large company, and the uh, majority of its business right now is related to LEDs and LED lighting. So I'll sort of start us off with a snapshot of where the industry is. Um, and this is the usual, sorry, Cree is a public, uh, public company, so what this says is just be careful, take what I say with a grain of salt. Um, and whatever you do, don't invest, make investment decisions based on what you hear here uh, today. Uh, just a brief uh, <clears throat> introductory slide here. Uh, you know, how we, just to bring everybody on the same page, you know, the typical uh, white light, the different ways to make white light with LEDs, but what's really dominating the industry right now is this approach I've shown here, is we take a blue LED chip, uh, we add a blend of phosphors, which down converts some of the, some of the blue light, uh, to create a white spectrum, uh, and it's all packaged in something like a little surface mount package, typically, uh, you know, millimeters to uh, centimeters in size. Um, and you can see the reason this has sort of become the industry workhorse is it, it's got that, uh, what we really need for lighting, which is relatively easy to manufacture, and you can really tune the white output um, to the particular application. Lighting is a very diverse market, uh, so it's no good having one device uh, that will try to serve them all. You really have to tailor the device. And see here just some spectra where you take different amounts of blue, different amounts of phosphor, yellow, reds, and green phosphor in the blend to get the different whites. And in some cases, you can build up uh, some more sophisticated level, uh, color spectra at the, spect at the system level by combining sort of yellow LEDs or these white LEDs with red LEDs, and that's that bottom one. Um, 
So I'll just give you a brief, this is where we sort of snapshot of where we're at right now. There's been some rapid progress I'll talk about a little bit later, but uh, what you're seeing in the top left here, industry has sort of coalesced around two or three sort of basic chip designs. These are the blue LED chips shown here. Um, sort of basic technology uh, platforms, uh, thin chips that just emit in a two-dimensional layer uh, to transparent contact. Uh, chips and then flip chips, which sort of is, uh, the, the, the large one on the top left there is a flip chip uh, that's a faceted uh, silicon carbide substrate you can see there. And then so this, these basic technologies have proliferated into different sizes depending on the, app, the final application. And then there's also again to sort of go along with the chips, there's two or three different basic approaches to incorporate the phosphor uh, in a wide variety of, of package types uh, just depending on the final application. Um, so this is uh, sort of top production performance currently. Top uh, white LEDs, this is actually a, a, the, the, that, that large faceted chip on the top left. Uh, this is a typical package for that. It's a one millimeter die in a three and a half millimeter package. This sort of leads the pack just a little bit. Uh, they all end up, all these different technologies, right, if you do it right, they all end up with about the same efficacy right now for a given input quality material and a given output spectra you're trying to achieve. So what you see there in the graph is the efficacy we can achieve uh, as a function of input power um, and for different whites. So there's just three different curves there from a cool white, for, well, uh, sort of daylight through the warm whites you see sort of at your home. Um, and so what you can see there, so this is efficacy at an elevated temperature around 85 degrees C. This is sort of typical for a lighting application, give or take. Um, so these are sort of realistically what you can achieve uh, out of a white LED component. You see there at the, you see the, uh, the peak is we're getting up close to the sort of the 200 lumens per watt with the cool white, 180 lumens per watt, uh, and then it falls off. But what's key is right now is you can get uh, working devices, you know, you can buy product well in excess of 100 lumens per watt, um, which is sort of a real nice, threshold in terms of allowing you to do things and really challenge the incumbent uh, lighting technologies. So one of the things you see here is the, um, is the, the droop, uh, the fall off in efficacy as a function of input power density. Uh, you'll hear about more from this from, uh, from Mike, no doubt, and, and, and probably Steve. Um, a few years ago, when we were sort of down at the 50 lumen per watt level, uh, you know, this was a real problem. Uh, you know, if you can barely get the 50 lumens per watt and then you lose uh, a third or half of it as you, as you go to higher power densities, that's a real issue. But now the peak efficiencies are well above this 100 lumens per watt. This droop has become less of an issue in terms of getting in the way of making real uh, useful lighting systems that can compete in the marketplace. So this is just a snapshot of, uh, well, this is shows the rapid progress over the last few years. I don't know how often you've been exposed to solid state lighting. If your information is more than a couple of years old, it really is out of date. This is a fast moving uh, industry. And you can see in two ways, the, uh, so the efficacy curves has, uh, well, the efficacy you can achieve out of white component has gone up by sort of almost you know, a factor of three since uh, you know, 2005 when sort of the first lighting class LEDs first came out. That's a fairly rapid uh, uh, trend. Uh, it should continue, uh, hopefully, for a little bit longer. Um, what's more important, though, I would argue, for really getting solid state lighting growing and getting it to the end user is the cost at which you, you, know, you can achieve the sort of 100 lumen per watt benchmark level. And that, that is the blue curve, and that has dropped a lot, lot more. That's dropped sort of like the you know, factor of 10 is what it costs you at the LED component level just to achieve uh, you know, some number of lumens at 100 lumens per watt. And that's what's really been driving the adoption uh, over the last couple of years. And so I'm just gonna give you a, a, a real life example. Um, so 2008, this is for an architectural trough. This is sort of be your, um, you know, think fluorescent tubes, uh, fixtures in a industrial uh, office setting kind of thing, right? So something where it's got to be reasonably high quality light, uh, several thousand lumens, few thousand lumens, typically in the ceiling, right? Uh, so in 2008, uh, we were able to put out a product um, that was getting sort of 65 lumens per watt 
90 CRI, which is a measure of the color quality, so it's a very nice, uh, pleasing light, and, uh, much better than what you typically get from a, from a uh, fluorescent fixture. This thing was sort of, we had to throw a ton of LEDs at it just to get to that level. Um, and you can see the picture at the bottom left there, it's just a sea of LEDs uh, just to get enough power or enough efficiency. And then, well, you have a lot of LEDs, they do heat up, so you have to have a large heat sink. So that's what that big black thing in the, in the bottom right picture is. It's basically a fairly large chunk of metal to take the heat out of the back of the park. So all up, this is about $400 is what it would cost you to buy one of these. Um, with those efficacy gains that have been so rapid and the cost gains that have been so rapid the last few years, we've really been able to drastically change the values. So this, is, this is the sort of a next generation device we call CR22. It's basically the same product. It looks different in the end because what we've done, once you have these very different or much more higher performing LEDs, you need a lot fewer of them. You need a lot, your heat sinking uh, gets a lot different. You can basically redesign the system from the ground up to take advantage of these very, these much more efficient devices. So it ends up looking different to the end customer. It gives them what they want. It's exactly the same thing. So 3,200 lumens, 90 CRI. So this is now 100 lumens per watt. I mean, this is a product. You can buy this. Uh, it uses about 30 LEDs, uh, and they're just arranged in a, in a strip there. You see that in the bottom left picture. Just a central st uh, strip of LEDs that sits on a heat sink, very small heat sink. Gives them enough heat sinking capability to, to maintain the lifetime. And this now only costs about $159. So, I mean, that's a pretty uh, large drop in the price. Uh, but what's critical for the adoption is now the payback. And I have to admit, uh, Claude Weisbuch has started quizzing me on, on, on payback, and I, I haven't actually gone through the calculator, so I'm having to trust my marketing department here. So uh, bear with me. Uh, when, all, when you take into account the energy gains, the replacement costs, the initial costs, um, compared to the, the fluorescent, uh, architectural trough that this is supposed to uh, replace, you're now getting down to where the payback or the return on investment is, is less than a year. That is a very easy sell. Right? Anybody who uh, is looking at their, their budget, running a building, thank you, um, they are going to pick this up. Uh, and, and they are. So this, is, this, is, this, this technology gains at the component level is really showing up uh, all the way through the system level. Um, I'll skip that. So that was just one example that's a troffer. There's a, there's a huge number of other applications where it's a similar th story, where you have this, you know, this dra rapid drop in the cost of achieving what you need at the, as the end goal. So there's a lot of um, adoption. We're still at the early stages. I did want to touch on the light bulb here, because you know, people, people understand the light bulb, right? You get to see this. This is what you pick up at the Home Depot. Nobody goes and buys a troffer. I mean, regular people don't go out and buy a troffer and reinstall it in their home, right? So the light bulb. Yeah, how, far, how close are we to that? And uh, if you had to design a fixture which was less suited for LEDs, good luck, because the trying to replace the incandescent, it's, 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 you know, apart from its low efficiency, uh, it's got great light, um, or for lifetime, right? but it's very small, and you've got to get lighting going all directions. That is a tough nut to crack uh, with the LEDs. And it's very low cost, right? So you've got to go into the, yep. Um, uh, so I think we're there, just about. You can tell me. Sorry, I had, this is the shameless Cree plug. Uh, this is a, a new light bulb, and it just came out like a month ago. And the key thing here is, I think we finally got it down to where the value proposition is getting there. So it's a $10 light bulb at the Home Depot for 40 watt equivalent, 13 bucks rate for a 60 watt equivalent. Uh, my wife's not running out to go buy these yet, so I'm not sure the value argument is quite there, but it's pretty close. And this is really, you know, it's still a complicated system compared to the, uh, you know, where it has to get to, but it's getting there value wise. So, and I will, uh, I will leave this because I'm out of time. Go to the next one. Thank you. Hello, I'm Mike Krames, uh, Chief Technology Officer at, uh, Officer at Sora. 
Um, just a word about Sora. We're actually founded uh, from founders from University of California, Santa Barbara, including Shuji Nakamura, who invented the blue LED, uh, and uh, Steve Denbars here is on the panel with me. So we have uh, strong ties to Santa Barbara that we're uh, uh, very fond of. Uh, I have just two concepts that I want to try to convey. Um, thanks to James for laying the landscape. And I think it's clear that Cree's done a, a great job in uh, establishing leadership in the U.S. and where LEDs can go today. Um, but we see opportunity uh, beyond where uh, even Cree is today in terms of cost reduction and also addressing certain quality of light aspects uh, that uh, are there today, even with LEDs, that we think need to be addressed for mass adoption. So those are the two main uh, topics I want to mention today. When we talk about cost, uh, or, well, actually, let me, I guess, start with the, kind of the base of the technology. So what is LED 2.0? Um, LED 1.0 is the first generation of LEDs based on uh, Shuji Nakamura's invention back in the 90s at Nichia Chemical Company. And that was uh, related to the fact that you could grow gallium nitride on uh, foreign materials like sapphire. Um, all the other 3.5 semiconductors had substrates that you could grow from the melt. Uh, and that was also true for silicon, by the way. So you had substrate technology uh, available so you could grow lattice match structures where the atoms would go in the right places and you could grow very defect-free material, which is required for a semiconductor that's gonna have a band gap. And so the notion that you could grow a single phase material on a foreign substrate was a radical one and it really ushered in uh, the first uh, era of technology up till this day. Uh, and that's true also for the, the results that uh, James talked about. In their case, the foreign substrate silicon carbide, but you still have the issue that the material is, is defected. And that this puts limitations in terms of the reliability, in terms of the power density that's capable. And so with the uh, LED 2.0 or GAN on GAN approach that, as we call it, we are putting the active device layers directly on their native substrate. So the dislocation densities or defect densities are reduced by several orders of magnitude, and that allows us to uh, basically operate the light, uh, LEDs at much higher power densities. Uh, that gives us higher brightness, higher uh, luminosity uh, in applications, smaller chips, uh, and there's also a cost impact, and that's kind of shown and has a good analogy to Moore's Law. So if you think about Moore's Law, there's a couple different ways to think about it. One is transistor count, so more functionality in a chip. Another way to think about it is in terms of transistor density or the size of the chips, the number of chips per wafer. At the end of the day, an IC manufacturer wants to sell more chips, not necessarily more, um, uh, well, once a functionality is uh, at a certain level, you want to sell more chips. That's the, the main thing, and a higher density of chips allows you to do that. We have the same opportunity with LEDs. If you look at now lumen density, and this is developed after uh, observation that Roland Heights had back at HP, I think Wagi mentioned Roland uh, earlier in this early solid state lighting white paper in the 90s, there seemed to be this progression of lumen density as a function of time. And what we've seen though in the last few years is that uh, improvement begins to be slowing. And in order to get more lumens out in these uh, large lighting applications where you need thousands of lumens, people are putting more and more chips in. And I think you could see that in some of the uh, slides that uh, we just saw. Um, and so you actually see things going the other way. The lumen density is going down. And that, the reason that that's happening has to, uh, to do with these limitations that I talked about in the materials. It has to do with the uh, LED droop phenomenon, which is a uh, as we know and is confirmed now as Auger recombination, there's an interesting history there, and I'll leave it to Steve to tell you about that history. Um, but just throwing more chips at the solutions to get more light output and maintain efficacy, we think is fundamentally not the long-term way to go for cost reduction, reduce, reducing the use of rare earth materials, or reducing the use of uh, the, the amount of electronic waste. So there's an opportunity to do something better. And with GAN on GAN technology in this uh, data point here at about 250 lumen per square millimeter is where our first generation uh, technology uh, launched last year put us by having a GAN on GAN, GAN based LED platform, we're able to operate in a completely different regime and continue to push lumen density forward without sacrificing efficacy. Uh, our Gen 2 products that we just announced uh, last week have a 50% higher uh, number than what I'm showing here. So we see this as a way to fundamentally 
uh, drop the cost of manufacturing the LEDs. Again, what matters in a semiconductor fab is when you have one lot of wafers going through, what we sell is lumens. So it's the lumen density of the wafers that matter. It's not, it's not anything else. That's the main thing. Um, so that's uh, our perspective on cost. These are the products that we have right now. You know, again, small startup. We have a first line of products. They're built around the MR16 lamp. Uh, you're probably familiar with them. If you've, if you've uh, looked in hotels and restaurants, you'll see these low voltage lamps. Uh, the sweet spot of the halogen uh, devices that we're replacing is around 50 watt equivalents. We're actually able to achieve, achieve up to 75 watt uh, equivalents um, with our LEDs and absolutely no compromise in the spectrum. And I'll talk about that uh, a little bit more here. Um, uh, very happy with the uh, market acceptance. We've got a number of awards on the design and look. We have uh, a real uh, side by side compared to halogen, you would not know it's different in terms of the color quality, except that it puts out a, less, a lot less heat and saves you 80 to 85% of the energy. Um, so it's very compelling. And the payback uh, for these lamps is, is as uh, James said, this one year payback is a real critical period. That's true for these lamps as well. Um, the other barrier to adoption, in addition to cost, uh, we believe is quality. And we have no further to look than with compact fluorescence to see how not to do that, okay? So we've had energy efficient technology for more than 20 years at our disposal with compact fluorescence, and we could have been putting those into our homes. Uh, at the end of the day, up till now, the penetration is on the order of 15% or so, depending on what report you look at. Um, by far, this is not a uh, success. <laughs> uh, and if you, uh, McKinsey, uh, this is the table that I adopted here from their report on lighting the way. Uh, they interviewed people across all different segments, you know, residential, office, industrial, shop, hospitality, um, and architectural. You uh, ask people what they care about, quality, like quality is number one. The only exception was in the residential where price and quality were kind of on par. But the bottom line is that we've grown up and evolved with light uh, for, in the case of natural light, you know, millions of years evolution, at least with incandescent light uh, over 100 years. Everybody, to some extent, is an expert in lighting and wants life to look a certain way. And the bottom line is with CFLs, we didn't get that. We got weird colors, we got warm up, a uh, time where colors changed as the lamps were turned on and, and, and turned off. Um, and other, you know, of course, there were other aspects like reliability. Uh, of course, they're poisonous, right? These other kinds of things are, are issues. Um, and the, the, the exciting thing here is that we know all that, so why on earth are we gonna do it again? And we don't have to do it again, but we have to think about these other aspects, color uniformity, color rendering, whiteness rendering, uh, which may seem like a new topic, but it, um, and for most of us, I guess it is, but I'll talk on that. The beam quality, dimmability, and the environmental aspects uh, are all critical factors we have to keep in mind as well. Um, so how is Sora doing this? Uh, in terms of color quality, we are the only LED company that makes end products that use the full visible spectrum. So we actually put enough energy into the LEDs to start with three electron volts energy, so violet, and pump a cascade of phosphors to get the entire visible spectrum. So we go all the way, there's no UV, we start right at the violet, all the way to the deep red, they get very, very high color rendering, and then there's no infrared whatsoever. Um, we think that's about the best you can do, and that's what we call it, our marketing guys, anyway, call it the perfect spectrum. Um, so we get the best of what you would have with daylight or with incandescence, but with none of the bad stuff, no UV, no IR. And we do much better than the blue-based LEDs. So visible spectrum starts in violet, not in the blue. If you start in the blue, you're missing that first violet part, and because of the Stokes gap between blue emission and phosphors, you also end up with a little gap in the cyan for most uh, uh, LEDs. And that's true for 99% of the LEDs out there today. You have this broken spectrum with no violet and a gap in the cyan. Um, and for reference, there's other um, uh, cartoons of spectra out there too, ceramic metal halide and compact fluorescent, which is even worse, just narrow spikes of light. At the end of the day, these sources do not render materials naturally. Um, not only in terms of color rendering, but also in terms of textured materials and other things. And I don't have time to get into all of that. Um, you'll see more of that as we, as we develop uh, this technology over the, the coming years. But one aspect I'd like to, to bring up, because it's such an obvious one, or at least it seems obvious, but it, it uh, surprises people every time that uh, uh, we bring it up. At the Light Fair booth uh, last week, um, we had a Sora MR16 and, and a competitor lamp up. Uh, just looking at white materials, cotton t-shirt, 
uh, a white mouse and white earbud uh, phones from a, a California-based uh, computer company. And in the one case you look at, in this, under the SOAR lamp, you have this vibrant, you know, white appearance of the materials. And in the, com the competitor, big lighting company lamp, the stuff looks yellow. And the reason it looks yellow is that most manufactured white goods have, over the decades, been incorporating optical brighteners. And that's true for cosmetics, paper, clothing, uh, the tablecloths here, uh, my shirt, uh, this pen. <laughs> a lot of stuff has uh, these optical brighteners, and they've been engineered over time to really give you that crisp white appearance when uh, illuminated by broadband spectral with a, a emission, whether it's daylight or halogen. And so at Sora, you know, we started talking to retailers and who were missing something. We realized this is what they're missing. We've dialed in uh, uh, the violet emission from our LEDs to be able to really nail this whiteness aspect. And, and I raise it because it's on par uh, with color rendering in terms of being important for rendering materials the way we all expect they should be rendered. So you can't imagine a retail store with you know, white clothing where during the day everything looks great and white, and then at nighttime they turn yellow. Right? That's absolutely uh, not acceptable. So these are exactly the kinds of things that we need to have eyes wide open about as we go forward with LED technology. And uh, uh, SOAR's job, as we see it, is to provide that path. Absolutely no compromise on both color rendering, whiteness rendering, all the other qualities of the lighting aspect that you want, and what the long-term entitlement to fundamentally lower cost at the semiconductor level. And so those are my two thoughts. Program. Uh, she's a manager of the solid state lighting program. She'll talk about key performance attributes and metrics for solid state lighting market adoption. Thank you very much. Um, I'm Kelly Gordon. I'm with Pacific Northwest National Laboratory, and we provide the lead technical support to the DOE solid state lighting program. I'm very happy to be with you here to talk about um, SSL market adoption. I think we've heard about how quickly. Um, LED technology is advancing and how much it has come so far. Um, and it's, it, you could get the idea that um, you know, LEDs are everywhere. We're starting to see them in many more applications. We were at Light Fair in Philadelphia last week and pretty much all you see is LED there. But the reality is that we're still at relatively low levels of market penetration for this technology in the lighting market. Uh, DOE just published a report on LED market adoption and for nine different product categories, and most of them are less than 1% of the market. The top one is MR16 um, reflector lamps, which are at about 10%. Um, so, so why isn't it um, you know, higher at this point? What are the hangups? I'm going to talk about several, and, and obviously there are many things going on here um, in the marketplace. But, but these are three key areas I want to touch on. Uh, the first is product variability. Um, it's still a very dynamic stage of the development of this technology. These are by no means commodity products. They are individual, need to be individually evaluated. Um, controls is a really hot topic in our, in our industry right now in lighting. Um, and LEDs open up as a solid state technology they open up a world of control that we have never known in lighting before. Um, and that has tremendous opportunities in it and tremendous challenges. We're putting a new technology on top of the existing infrastructure in our buildings and our homes. And then, of course, there's the cost and value propositions. So let's talk about performance variability. This is just one example. Um, this is, has to do with luminous efficacy, the amount of light that you're getting out of LED products for each watt of energy going in. Um, and this is based on the DOE LED Lighting Facts database, which has more than 7,000 products in it now. Um, and it started back in the third quarter of 2009. You can see the average efficacy at that point was 38 lumens per watt. Um, now, as of the first quarter of 13, we're up to 72 average. But also look at those, those whiskers, the tails, the max and min. There is huge variability. We've got a couple of products in that database now that, um, that have photometric reports indicating they have 140 lumens per watt, 170 lumens per watt. Um, very high, but the bottom 
is still at the levels of, of say, incandescent uh, light sources. And this is just one area where there's great variability in the products. Uh, color characteristics, lifetime and reliability, dimming performance, there's variability in all of those areas. So what are people to do when, they're, when there's such great variability and you can't tell, is an LED product gonna be good or bad? Um, you have to get the facts, you have to do some homework and some legwork usually. Uh, fortunately, there's a growing number of resources that are available to help out with that. The Department of Energy does offer a number of them, including the Lighting Facts Program, um, gateway demonstrations, caliper testing. We do a lot of the testing in-house. We also work with uh, testing laboratories and make that information public so that you can uh, sort the wheat from the chaff. There's also the Energy Star Program, Design Lights, and uh, an increasing capability of the manufacturers to know and report using industry standards. Now in the controls area, as I said, huge area of potential. We'll be able to do things with lighting that we've never been able to do before, um, but it's gonna take some time to get there because controls are not easy to implement. And in the lighting industry, you know, we laugh about this because it, it should be easier. Um, but just something as simple as dimming. And here in California, uh, starting next year, commercial buildings, light sources will all have to be dimmable. So this is a serious issue. It could have serious implications. Um, this is one example of some LED troffer fixtures, the kind that go in your office, um, and the flicker waveform. So it, the, what is the light output doing when the dimmer is at 100%? There's no visible flicker. It's, at a, it's just at a steady level. When you move that dimmer switch down to 75% for this particular fixture, um, you start to see the light output going up and down. And at, at this frequency, at this level, this would be detectable by many people. So that can be a problem. Um, there are standards efforts working to overcome some of these issues. NEMA just published a SSL 7, or the, the first part of it, which will be an interface standard um, that addresses this interaction between dimmer switches and LED light sources. So it provides some design criteria. And that is an incremental step. Standards obviously take a long time uh, to happen, um, but this is, is one step in the process that will help. There are also non-standards approaches that we can take. And one example is DOE's model specification for adaptive control for LED roadway lighting. Uh, this is really aimed at municipalities and utilities and others that run street lighting systems on how to um, spec control systems. It's not an industry standard, it's not required, um, but it is a consensus specification. So cities can use this document when they go to spec out a system and they can modify it as needed. And then finally, cost and value. We've been talking about how the costs are coming down. And they certainly are. Um, but in most cases, LED products are quite a bit more expensive than traditional light sources. Uh, but this is one example. This is from the city of Seattle. Uh, they've been implementing a multi-year program of purchasing LED streetlights um, and changing out their streetlights in the city. Um, so over the past four years, they've been seeing significant decreases in the prices, uh, per unit prices for large volume purchases. That's about 17 or 18% average per year that those are coming down. And then to loop back to controls in this, in this cost scenario, uh, controls can be a real value added um, to LED systems. And LED, because it is a solid state technology, is inherently more controllable than traditional light sources. With um, high intensity discharge sources especially, uh, you can't put them on an occupancy sensor normally because there's a restrike time. You know, it, when it goes off, you gotta wait for it to cool down before you can strike it again to, to turn it on. And this was the problem at the Super Bowl, right? The, the lights went out and they had to wait because if they'd had LED, they could have brought them right back up. Um, so, so the controls can help the cost and the value proposition uh, with, with LED lighting. This is an example from a parking garage. This was a gateway demonstration project at the Department of Labor in DC. Uh, we changed out the high pressure sodium lighting in the parking garage to LED, and that alone 
drop the energy use by 50% um, while maintaining the necessary light levels. Um, but then the addition of occupancy sensor controls um, decreased that further, and then fine-tuning the controls um, so that it was really tuned to the way that garage was used um, and adjusting the time delay uh, yielded a total of 89% energy savings. So it can make a big difference, and it's because of this enabling technology that it is inherently controllable um, that makes a better, a better story and a better proposition. And it should lead to better lighting services and potentially other services, the integration of controls with, uh, say, responsiveness to the electrical grid, uh, integration with emergency systems. We'll be able to get more information from our lighting systems than we've ever been able to do so before. It won't be just a light sitting there. It will be doing something useful. And I'm going to stop there a little bit early. Thank you. And our last speaker is Professor Dean Burns, who will talk to us about a glimpse of the future of solid state lighting. Thanks, Wogi, and, and thanks, uh, John and Dave, for organizing such a wonderful conference. Uh, so I'll talk to you a little bit about what I see as the future directions of solid state lighting. Uh, been in the industry 20 years and, and seen it finally get to lighting is quite, quite exciting. Uh, so I'm going to go out a little bit on a limb here and, and just say that I think that we're going to see lighting revolutionized from the simple light bulb into complete communication systems that potentially could, you could do internet over, but also systems that you can control and actually improve your health because of things like seasonal affective disorder or other things, or just sleep disorders. It turns out that uh, it turns out Alzheimer's patients, if you irradiate them with blue light during the daytime, they can actually sleep better at night. So there's, there's going to be a real revolution here. So uh, starting with, uh, let's see if this pointer works over here. Yeah. Uh, with the uh, new chip designs, I think you're going to see companies like Cree and Sora continue to make new designs. Uh, Cree has a very innovative chip on silicon carbide, where they use it for high light extraction. Mike mentioned the gallium nitride substrates. Both of these offer advantages for different products. One's for MR16 and, and one's more for light bulbs, uh, 60 watt that is. Uh, I think we're going to see the efficiency droop being solved in our lifetime, hopefully. And uh, some of my colleagues have recently further concluded and, and elucidated the mechanism of droop, which was actually first proposed by Mike Krams at LumaLeds, and I'll show you a view graph on that. And so what we've seen over this past 10 years is the lumen density keeps increasing and increasing, and you need less chips, but also the size of the lighting system is being reduced. One example of this is, uh, that I'll mention is the projector bulb, uh, which is going from uh, a basically metal halide based to laser based, and the size of the projector is being reduced, uh, hopefully to the size of your cell phone someday. I think you're going to start to see intelligent LED lighting systems, and, and Kelly alluded to this, and I think this is going to be one area for huge growth opportunities. Uh, both for services, but basically being able to completely control the color of your light bulb and the hue, but also building communication networks. You know, we'll be able to sell you a light bulb maybe for the same price or a few cents more that also can communicate at about a, a gigabit per second. Uh, so this would have enormous, uh, you know, added features to the lighting. And uh, like I said, you could have it be adjustable or like she said, have it on motion sensors. You can imagine street lights, which only turn on when there's a car approaching. This would save enormous amounts of energy in some of the, the street lighting in highways that are, uh, doesn't need to be on all the time. Uh, finally, I, I think one of the little bit more farther out ideas I've been having and, and trying to convince people is that I think laser lighting, in which you down convert the laser light to white, has the opportunity to completely revolutionize lighting by being distributed over fiber optics or being fixtureless lighting. That is, the size reduction afforded by a laser lets you really rethink what kind of lighting you can do. So I'll touch a little bit on these. Uh, first, let's talk about the intelligent LED light system. So here's a little cartoon I took from uh, off the web, but I thought it would kind of portray what I really foresee lighting as being in the future, is that you'll have light bulbs that can communicate with your iPhone or your computer. You can have them uh, be on sensor or alarm, so you can see basically you could have a social preference. Let's say some people like a really cold uh, lighting, which is considered about 6,500 Kelvin. Uh, it turns out people in the Western world here, we prefer warm white, it's called. And so when you come in the room, the lighting might change to your color preference, which you could have encrypted on your PDA or cell phone. 
Uh, you could even think of doing fairly high speed networks. And this doesn't even have to be direct line of sight. We did some early studies on this at Hewlett Packard. It was over 20 years ago. And you can do about four bounces off a wall. So you could have a light bulb in this room being communicated with somebody as long as it's only about four wall bounces away. So I think we're going to see lots of opportunity in basically reinventing the light bulb. It's not just about light anymore. Uh, some of the future trends that is going on right now and, and I see is continuing. Uh, James mentioned the dominant workhorse here is where you take a blue LED light and you down convert it with yellow and red phosphors. This currently dominates the market uh, because it's the lowest cost and it also gives you the best efficiency. Uh, however, uh, Mike had mentioned a violet pump pumping uh, three phosphors can give you the best light quality and consistency at a reasonable cost and particularly for the uh, MR16 or the directional light shows some advantages. And then I think uh, the red, green, blue LED affords you the ability of complete color tunability and actually all three of these can be communication enabled. So there's going to be, I think, a lot of research going on on how to increase the, the data rate speeds and, and even setting up what kind of uh, standards we need to do there. i uh, just like to put in one, one plug here for one thing that both the university's done, but also uh, on the theory of droop. This is what causes that efficiency drop that James and, and had mentioned at the first, why we can't get a single LED to put out a lot more light. And uh, it was initially actually proposed by Mike Krams here when he was at LumaLeds. Uh, in 2007, it took us basically uh, six years to actually get the experimental verification of this droop mechanism, uh, and then further refined the theory by Chris Vanderwall about two years ago. So this was just announced last week uh, by Jim Speck and Claude Weisbusch, where the uh, electrons, rather than give off light when you put electricity in it, it basically gives off uh, additional electron, which then gives off heat, which causes the efficiency to drop. So now that we understand the fundamental mechanism, I think many groups around the world are going to be working hard to solve this with various different uh, TIP schemes. Some other new technologies that, that promise uh, further improvements in efficiency and also uh, cost reduction. Uh, photonic crystals have always theoretically shown the promise of having very high efficiency in terms of light extraction. Uh, we continue to work on this with uh, Claude and, and groups around the world on trying to get higher light extraction. Uh, Pure bulk allium nitride, in which we actually slice the crystals at different crystal planes, show great promise in helping us solve the uh, droop issue. Uh, and, if, and we're applying many of the cost reduction techniques that, like Stephen Chu said, if you find a cheaper way to make bulk allium nitride, everybody would switch to this overnight. However, today it's expensive, but we're envisioning and we've uh, demonstrated some new techniques to make this process cheaper. So uh, that holds great potential for future research directions. And then uh, thirdly, I touched a little bit on the laser diode uh, work. Uh, this has great promise, I think, for directional lighting. And this is actually a mock-up uh, from a BMW a motor company has done that says that this would reduce the size of the car headlight to extremely small uh, because it gives you a truly point source. And what they have here is there's a phosphor uh, disc in the middle here, and they're hitting it with a blue laser. So you're not going to be blinded by these uh, headlights, it turns out, because it's converted into the white light but it's extremely directional because you have such a, a nice point source and it's already at 80 lumens per watt, which is very early stage for the, the laser uh, because the laser is not as efficient as the LED to date, but 80 lumens per watt is pretty decent. It's actually better than the halogen it's replacing, which is about uh, uh, 30 uh, lumens per watt. And uh, like I said, several automobile companies around the work are now working on this. So you'd have very small headlights in the front of your car. That would reduce the space needed for the lighting system. Uh, so this is kind of a, what I've envisioned is some of the future work that we have to do. Uh, and again, one of the things that make this so small is it basically is one one hundredth of the size of the, of the traditional power LED tip. Uh, other places, you can actually buy a laser diode based uh, display system today. It's the Casio projector. Um, this just shows the optics. They use a, a blue laser here to pump a green phosphor wheel and they actually combine that with a red LED. This has let them shrink the projector down to about half the size of the one that's shown in this room. Actually, it's much smaller than that one. Uh, that's an old style one. Um, and then there's work going on at Sandia Labs where Jeff Zhao has been a, uh, a proponent of actually using not just the phosphor converted, but actually using four color lasers to display certain things. And they actually get very good color rendering, which is actually quite surprising to me. So I'd like to conclude in the last minute of my talk by talking a little bit about what uh, the National Research Council has 
just came out about three months ago with their recommendations for uh, funding for solid state lighting, but where um, this is a panel I helped serve on with about 14 other members, uh, and it kind of hits on some of the points that the speakers have mentioned. The first one I think Kelly mentioned is dimmability is still not quite there with the LED lighting. You have to go kind of dimmer by dimmer because certain people have different drivers and, and dimming functions in their room. So uh, there needs to be better standards set up for dimmer controls uh, for the LED. But then you look, a lot of the basic recommendations from the NRC I want to emphasize basically came back to basic material science uh, issues where they want to see funding of the processes, the crystal growth technique uh, to use LED, LED manufacturers is a very complex oven, I call it, an MOCVD process where they more monitors and better uniformity will give us much better cost reduction. Um, development in new materials for substrates, uh, particularly gallium nitride substrates. Uh, they want to see continued investments in, in the core technology. And this is actually, since I've got the podium, I can say a little bit about it. Core technology only gets about $20 million in federal research dollars a year. And companies, uh, or countries like Korea and China are investing on the orders of hundreds of millions in this area because it's deemed of uh, significant importance for the economy. So that's one area where I personally would like to see more research spent is on some of the core fundamental materials research. And then uh, finally, DOE is, has been guiding this program for over 12 years. And I just want to, the recommendation was to make sure that they cover an extensive amount of materials and devices that we can continue to deliver lower cost LED lighting and uh, make it affordable for everybody so that we can switch over to LED lighting, which I foresee happening in the next five, to five years. And, I think Jeff Henley, uh, I just want to last plug, Jeff said he believes by 2020, 100% of all the lighting will be uh, LED. So I hope he's right. Thanks. I can't believe it. It's 41 minutes. That's nice. So you kept on time. And... Uh, but open it for questions, so if you have questions, please line up here on those two, uh, behind those two microphones, and I'll just get the group started with one question that has been bothering me, actually, despite the progress that you described. And uh, Kelly mentioned some of the issues that are standing in the way of wide deployment and having this technology being very pervasive. Uh, very quickly, in one minute each, what, what is it that, that you think is, is, is really the reason for why it's taking longer. I mean, every technology takes really longer than expected, and I hope that uh, Jeff is, is, is correct in his 2020 prediction. But uh, what's stopping from having lights everywhere at LEDs? Jim, your one minute. <laughs> Thank you. <clears throat> I think it's certainly one thing is it's only recently where the efficiency has really got to where it needs to be on a you know, manufacturable basis, so maybe the last couple of years, <coughs> um, where you can, so what, what we end up doing is you, you create a lot of lumens at the package level and then you tend to throw a bunch of it away as you, or at least en energy away as you build it up into the system. So we needed some headroom uh, that the components are now offering. And now, now that that's there, I think it's really, um, it's rolling things out. It just takes time to manufacture. There, there, it's not like there's three kinds of light bulbs, right, that you just replace. There are hundreds. And so it just takes time to choose them, go through all the engineering cycles, to roll them out, and there's a sales teams associated with it. So it's just a it's sort of knocking them off one by one now, I think. And so I think it is happening now. So come back in two years, I think you'll have a different perspective. Yeah, I think that's right. It, it, it does take time even when you have everything. We saw this with the LCD backlighting industry. We kept saying, win, win, win. And then, and then once you got past that knee and the S-curve, it just happened overnight. And then everything was LEDs. So um, it's going to be a little bit different than that because it is a fragmented market, as uh, James pointed out. But um, obviously costs have to come down. And I think there's also a, uh, a quality, as I mentioned, a quality aspect. Uh, people, at least at the residential consumer level, have been burned in the past. And uh, they're going to be hesitant, I think, to jump into something unless they really have that assurance that the, the quality is going to be there and the, the lifetime, lifetime, expected lifetime is actually going to be there as well. Kelly, you want to add to what you said? I would agree with what they said. Um, and 
it's just a very dynamic time still, and the products are changing so rapidly, and there are still gaps. So now you can get pretty good 60 watt replacement lamps if you go to Home Depot, um, but a lot of people want 100 watt replacement. That's much harder to do, and it's much more expensive. So it takes time for that all to work through and to get to prices that truly um, are competitive. Thank you. Okay, I'll just say I think the reason why it took so long uh, primarily was the cost, performance, quality. These three things kind of didn't kind of coalesce until I'd say just in the last year. So we didn't have the cost. For instance, just two years ago, it was $40 for a 60 watt light bulb. Now you can get it for 10 or 12.97, I guess, for <laughs> James. But the quality wasn't there. Everybody was complaining it was this bluish white. So now we've got the quality. And then the, the final remaining thing was the performance. The efficiency wasn't better than compact fluorescent. It was, let's say, a few years ago, it was 40, 50 lumens per watt. Now we have 80, 90 lumens per watt. So we beat compact fluorescent. And then uh, in R&D, people are talking about 200 lumens per watt. So now we're beating fluorescent on the, in the R&D stage. It'll still take a little while to get that into the product. but. Uh, yeah, so it's been those three things holding it back, and, and we can see the light at the end of the tunnel, so to speak. Very good. Okay, let's see. Name and affiliation, please. Yes, my name is Thomas Titler. I'm here with the Band of Angels. Uh, would you please give us some insights into the question of life expectancy, um, the improvements in life cycle? Um, uh, costing and also in life cycle duration in terms of years and also uh, what kind of testing regimes have you developed uh, to uh, help with accelerated a uh, aging uh, and uh, really test 25,000 or 40,000 or 50,000 um, hours of life expectancy. Thank you. Let's start That's with to the whole panel actually because nobody of you really touched on life expectancy. So thanks. Uh, let's start with industry first. Yeah, go ahead speak to that. Uh, so we take a page, we're semiconductor based, uh, all of us in the LED industry, and we take a page from the telecom industry in terms of accelerated life. So the two things you commonly push are power density and temperature, and you basically run the parts at, you know, ranges of temperatures, ranges of power densities, and by uh, using standard, you know, uh, Weibull distribution type analysis, you can thereby predict, get acceleration factors and predict life. That's pretty straightforward. Um, you can do the same thing with the electronics, and those have to be done as well if you're, you have a system product. Uh, sometimes you can be surprised. Uh, usually you're surprised by the things that you assume are going to be fine, <laughs> and you find out that they're not, uh, that uh, maybe standard things in assembly. But I think the basic uh, rubric we all go through for lifetime is pretty well understood, and, and almost everybody does it the same way. Um, in terms of target life cycles, uh, I'll go out on a limb and say that you know, really long lifetimes are nuts. Uh, for any kind of lighting product because they, in fact, lock you into energy inefficient technology. And if you look at the MYPP roadmap that the DOE uh, publishes and uh, calculate an optimum lifetime for an SSL product to minimize energy, cons energy consumption over the next 20 years, it's about a 10,000 hour life. It's not even the 25,000 that's rated today. So going to 50,000, $100,000 uh, hours is, I think, the wrong way to go because it puts all the burden on the manufacturers to make more expensive products that take longer to release. So we'd actually, uh, it would actually make sense to go the other way. Um, but there is this kind of emotional attachment right now to 25,000 hours, even though in a residential application, that's about 20 years today, which, which is silly. Yeah. James, you want to add to that? Yeah, that <laughs> there's sort of the, the dichotomy. If you... I mean, I agree with Mike. I mean, you, you really don't want to lock people in, but on the other hand, they've got to put out a lot of money to switch over, right? So there's this, okay, how soon am I going to have to replace this new bulb? I'm, I'm spending millions of dollars refitting my building. I want to know it's going to last a long time. So it's, a, it's an irrational uh, response, but it's a, re it's a real human response, right? Is they want to know it's going to last. I think that's what's sort of driving the McCree's right now. I've got this push rightly or wrongly the 10 year warranty, right? I mean, so the hours is 25,000 to 50,000 hours, depending on what the, op the application is. Um, but that seems to be sort of a comfort zone for people who are forking out the money. Um, so that's, it, it may be heading in the wrong direction from a long term energy uh, savings, but that seems to be what is helping to sell products right now. Any other comments? 
Uh, different market segments are going to have different considerations for life size too. Uh, I was thinking about the residential uh, segment for most of my comments, but I think James would have to agree that if you're designing a product for a 10,000 hour life versus a you know, 10 year life, you're you're able to make some choices that would affect the cost oh, of yeah. the product, and you could you could have cheaper products that would be adopted more quickly and uh, realize energy efficiency benefits more quickly, which is I think is what the DOE would like to see. I think there was maybe a tendency, especially at the beginning when, when, yes, LEDs were a lot more expensive, and so the argument to be made was, yeah, but they're going to last a really long time, and it's almost like we boxed ourselves in with that, putting everything on that argument that it's all about lifetime. Now, the, and, and so I think that will change, because it'll be more fine-tuned to the particular application, what makes sense, and allowing for um, people to be able to change it to, to upgrade to the next best thing. Now, um, the other aspect of this whole life issue is that there are not good industry standard test procedures yet for life. There's a lumen maintenance test procedure, but that is only a small part of the life and reliability issue. So, so you know, the industry may know kind of how to test uh, and, and project their own, uh, make their own life projections, but there are not good standards in that sense yet. So from the lighting, uh, the lighting community, um, you know, they take, they take all projections, I think, with a grain of salt until there is a common industry standard life testing procedure, which hopefully will happen relatively soon. Is, is anyone trying to do that? Is the Department yes, of Energy? Yes, the IES uh, Test Procedures Committee is working on several different aspects of that. Okay. Very good. Other questions? Good afternoon. Well, my name is Yuji Zhan with uh, Steve Denbrough and Shuji Nakamura in the UCSB. And I have a question uh, for uh, James, Mike, and Kelly on the uh, cost of LEDs. I can ask Steve because he's my boss. So uh, uh, I, I have a question regarding to the cost of the uh, LED. For the engineer and the scientists, we always tend to thinking the cost in the technology field, so we're thinking, oh, it's the manufacturer cost, uh, or it's really difficult, the material is very expensive. Uh, I, I, I want to ask if there is really a uh, marketing factor in determining the cost of the LED. For, for example, uh, we all know that uh, uh, the, the, the cost, the, the price of the product sometimes determined by the supply. So uh, if there's not enough LED company out there, so maybe there's not enough LED uh, produced every year, so the cost is high. And also another factor is that we're always thinking that, for example, uh, taking car as example, the 2014 car will be more expensive than 2013 car because the newer version. So if we're thinking fluorescent is an older version of live product, so is that a uh, marketing strategy for the uh, big, lighting company like Luminate that they, because the LED, comp, LED product is a newer version of technology, uh, that's why it's uh, more expensive than others. Okay, cost. Who wants to start? Uh, that's an interesting one, that last one. Uh, yeah, I've, I've read about it. The economists have studied this, right? If you price it low, nobody, everybody thinks it's junk, so they don't buy it. And then you price it high, and all of a sudden, oh, it's got to be good, so I'll buy it. Uh, no, I, I would say our marketing is not that sophisticated at this point, our sales team. If we could offer it um, at the same, exactly the same price as the incumbent and still make the required profit margin to keep everybody happy and funnel more money into R&D, we would. Uh, at least that's, that's Cree's perspective. We are, we are trying to get the price down as fast as we can because that really is driving, a lot of these applications, they're still too high priced to really drive that mass adoption, like get onto the steep part of the S-curve. Mike, you want to add? Uh, I agree with what, what James said. Uh, I guess one thought that came to mind when uh, during your question was, there's certainly, uh, people are willing to pay more for certain features, right? So if you have, um, you know, poor, better color rendering, for example, or controls, you know, these kinds of things. and. Um, I think, you know, as Steve touched on, Salt State Lighting provides a nice, a, a nice platform to add more value to people's lives, whether it's uh, affecting, uh, positively affecting their health, uh, reducing energy, uh, improving uh, interconnectivity, uh, all of those things, and, and those will uh, drive ASPs up because they're adding more value. So I have a question. Uh, Steve showed a slide about laser lighting, and he said for cars, this is convenient. I mean, you need a direction. The directional lighting 
uh, if it might give you eventually better efficiency. The LED guys, do you agree with him? I mean, will we see lasers in, in cars soon? Uh, well, it's, it's certainly being worked on. As Steve showed, the BMW guys are actually actively looking into this. It is a laser in the BMW? The, I believe it was a BMW group in this slide, right? Yeah, yeah they were uh, laser uh, converted for the phosphor uh -huh. uh, to get a bright yeah. spot. So as far as I can say, we work on both lasers and LEDs, so <laughs> we're going to be happy either way. Um, I think in terms of raw efficiency, um, the lasers uh, have a way to go to catch up with LEDs. Um, but they do have unique aspects, uh, like extremely high brightness. So in applications where you want to deliver the light uh, by fiber for design considerations or for environmental ones, we, mm -hmm. you know, it's too hot to get a light source in there. You could bring a fiber to it. Uh, applications like that, I think lasers are very interesting. And we'll no doubt see applications for lasers and lighting. The question is, you know, how many markets will, will it bear? Very good. Other questions from the audience? David? Uh, Steve, you made an intriguing comment about the health benefits of, uh, potential health benefits of LEDs. Uh, being of an age when getting a good night's sleep is actually a rather special thing. I wonder if you could elaborate for us in terms of uh, what, what is, um, first of all, what's the evidence base for this and, uh, and where do you see this going? Is it a potential market for LEDs? Yeah, I think so. It's based on a study out of uh, Rensselaer Polytechnical Institute that if you get a lot of the blue light breaks apart, breaks apart melatonin, which puts you to sleep. So you need to eliminate the blue light at night before you go to bed from your light bulb. Uh, so what, in other words, if you're looking at a computer screen with a lot of blue light, that'll keep you awake. So that's another thing you shouldn't do is read your iPad in bed, because that will keep you up at night. But so in other words, what I'm saying is their, their determination was you need to wake up with blue light, so when you wake up in the morning, you should get a good dose of blue light, but in the evening, you should drop all the blue light out of your light bulbs in your house. And then, uh, and additionally, uh, seasonal affective disorder is related to some other wavelengths, which are a little complicated. It's a red UV balance. Um, and, and so if you live in a climate where you get no UV light, it turns out, it's actually in the ultraviolet, um, you'll develop you know, depression. And uh, <laughs> there's a couple studies on that, that uh, strong light irradiation will help people get over this uh, seasonal affective disorder, which affects basically the top third of the U.S. Uh, so those are some of the health benefits. Uh, you know, at UCSB, we're tuning to these wavelengths, and we're basically, you know, collaborating with people at RPI to figure out what the right wavelengths are. But this is just really scratching the surface because we've never had a light source before that you could tune to improve productivity or wakefulness or sleep. More questions? Yes, please. Uh, what's the uh, uh, reason for the light to be so many years? What is the actual reason? And the second one is in terms of recycling, if there is any specific requirement, because for the moment the incumbent bulbs, we throw it to trash. So what are we supposed to do with the lead lights? So the lead light doesn't have any uh, mercury in it. So. Uh, there is some manufacturers that use lead in their process, but I think Cree sells a light bulb with no lead. Is that right? That's pretty much lead free so now. I, I think there's no recycling issue, so we don't have the regulation that CFL does. Um, I mean, we I would just, uh, DOE just published a life cycle assessment of LED lighting and comparing um, the, the materials that are in LED lighting products to traditional light sources and identified several uh, several metals that are, you know, exceed California standards, for example. Um, so the recommendation is there should be recycling for these products, but it's not currently part of, I think in California, you have the e-waste stream, right? Mm -hmm. So it would be very similar to, say, cell phones, uh, the type of materials that are in cell phones, and, and the recommendation would be that it should be recycled. And then the first part of your question had to do with why, why the long lifetime? Uh, why? What is the reason for the death of the lead? Oh, I see. So, so What's happening? Right. There's different failure modes, and that's part of what the industry is trying to understand, is what really is the limiting factor. We've talked so much about lumen maintenance of the LEDs themselves. You know, the, the long-term testing that DOE has done um, with, you know, tens of thousands of hours logged on products now, there, there have been very few LED failures. It's usually not the LEDs. It's everything else. Um, and depending on how it's used, depending on the temperatures, depending on the switching, depending on 
how it's wired, what kind of uh, circuits it's on. Um, it could be a lot of other components that That's fail before the LED. 30% is faster, I think, and it's the adhesion and yeah, so very few times it's uh, the LED itself. About 10%, sometimes there'll be a, some hydrogen moving around, but usually it's, it's literally the driver circuitry that fails. Mm -hmm. Faster. Well, the caution with that is poor quality products. I mean, you, you can definitely uh, kill an LED if you design the system badly, if it gets too hot. There, there's, you know, there's definitely a critical temperature. If they get above that, they will die very, very quickly, the, the actual LEDs themselves. So making sure that the, you know, the good quality product throughout the system is key. Unfortunately, it's very difficult to, to, to sort of spot from the outside. Um, so when that kind of comes to some of the standards, we're hoping to you know, make sure DOE enforces, right, on the, on the Energy Star. I mean, it's got to be real. So. Okay, one more question here. Hello, everyone. My name is Gaurav Agarwal. I am a software engineer, so I know nothing about <laughs> uh, LEDs. But uh, I just have a curious question, which is everyone spoke about the residential applications of LED, light bulbs, cars. Uh, but uh, nothing uh, came up about industrial usage. I would assume that uh, a lot of energy consumption belongs to the industrial uh, application of lighting. So where is LED in terms of industrial usage? Did you say industrial, uh, the application in industry, you mean? Industries, in, yeah. In, in commercial buildings and industry, or, or? Yeah, so in heavy industries, I'm assuming the uh, application, I mean, you would need uh, really uh, bright lights, like you spoke about 60 watt to 100 watt, how difficult is it to go from 60 to 100, there's so many costs. Uh, so I'm assuming in industries where you need uh, really heavy lighting, good lighting, uh, the uh, watts or the lumen, uh, luminous, <laughs> uh, whatever you need is supposed to be high. So is LED capable for industrial usage? I, I can take a, take a start at that anyway. Um, I think part of the issue has been the kind of outputs that are needed, as you say, in industrial applications. Often it's what we call high bay. Mm -hmm. um, the fixtures are mounted very high up on a ceiling in a, in a factory or somewhere. Um, and it's been difficult for LED products to achieve the kind of light output that you would need in those applications. That now is changing, and we're seeing an increasing number of low bay and high bay fixture types that have very good light output. Um, in theory, they should be, should be well suited to industrial applications. They can be vibration resistant. They can be pretty durable in that type of situation. So I think that's a, 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 an area that we'll see definitely more um, LED activity in. It's an area where we would have to be also cognizant of the flicker profile mm -hmm. of, of the fixtures. I mean, flicker could be, can be dangerous in, in industrial situations for sure. So we, we would want to be aware of that. I don't know if the others have more to add. Just as, a, as an example, I think we, we, you are seeing penetration begin to happen in the application too. So one company that comes to mind is uh, uh, Digital Lumens, which was founded by the, uh, some of the previous founders of Color Kinetics. And they're, they're focused exactly at industrial lighting, uh, all the benefits of efficacy plus uh, the controls aspects. And uh, um, so you could you know, follow up uh, on that. I have a question uh, I saw in in Mike's and James' presentation, you showed the uh, performance versus yield, the number of lumens per watt or lumens per, per die. And I noticed in 2010 to 2012, it's just in both of your graphs, it's like flat. There is no improvement. But then Sora is saying that the slope will change because you're using gallium nitride substrates. What will, why do you increase see the, the change in slope? I didn't see why you are predicting that. Uh, well, from source aspect, from lumen density, gets right back to the uh, growing the active layers on the native substrate. Uh, so we are using, uh, I would, one way to think about it is using laser quality material in an LED. So okay. we can run in much higher power densities and still maintain the efficacy. We also have a uh, technology roadmap uh, uh, based around <laughs> the, the fact that OJ recombination is something we have to deal with so we can manage to have uh, high efficiency at those high power densities. So the quality of the material? And, and the design of the active region. Those both have to come together. And Cree, where did you see the slope changing? Um, <coughs> well, okay, so the, the two graphs you're referring to had a slightly different y-axis, right? You were the sort of lumens density, yeah. which is essentially taking the same LED and running it harder. So, you know, Cree, 
pre-LEDs, you can run them that hard. At some point, you would run into the uh, you know lifetime issues. Everything gets hotter, but, and that's still the case for the GAN on GAN. You just don't see the efficiency drop off right at, at the higher density. Yeah, right, yeah, so. I would say we have uh, higher entitlement on junction temperature, probably. Right, right, right. Um, <clears throat> so the the flattening, I think you're referring to in my case is more. You know, we are going to run up against the sort of efficacy limits, right? Lumens mm -hmm. per watt. Right, so the spectral, the typical white spectrum that the LEDs put out right now is something around 300 lumens per optical watt. And then if you add, take into account the fact that you've got a phosphor down converting a lot of the blue or the violet, um, you can multiply that by 75%. So that's just a fundamental Stokes law. So you, so, you know, the maximum possible with our current spectra is sort of around this 225 uh, lumens per watt, right? So yeah. as we get closer to that, yeah, uh, it's going to get okay. more difficult. Uh, you know, we will we will run into against the fundamental limit. Now there are some things to be done. Uh, I think Steve touched on this, or uh, and also the spectral engineering. Uh, there's some work out of Sandia. Uh, in principle, you can start playing with the spectra and get the theoretical maximum up to sort of the 400 lumen per watt level. Uh, so that maybe is the next one, next phase. Next frontier. Uh, getting rid of the phosphor, right? Going to RGB, that would also raise, you know, that mm -hmm. gets rid of the Stokes loss. So there are possible sort of changes to change the slope of that, that. curve. Uh, I'm not sure it's necessary, uh, but that's that's probably out there. Good. We have time for one more question. I am so lucky. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, so, Larry Kelly, I'm also with the Band of Angels, and this is question is, is mostly for Steve, but certainly anybody on the panel could contribute if, if, uh, if appropriate. So, on the Li-Fi uh, idea, uh, and so some work has been going on on this for a while, and it seemed like that's sort of a broadcast technology, and, and so if you're at a tablet or a cell phone or whatever, and you want to communicate back, there has to be a way to do that. So maybe the question is, what are the architectural issues that you ran into and what kind of problems did you have when you were working on that stuff and where do you see that going? Uh, so, so most of the people are using uh, Bluetooth to communicate back to the light bulb, but you know, eventually I'd like to see uh, even a, maybe even a laser or a, a infrared LED in your, your computer PDA communicating back because that can also get into the hundreds of megabits per second type of range uh, to communicate back to it. So, but I guess if that's in its infancy, there's, there's only like a very few research groups even studying it. And uh, actually, there's probably more research going on in Europe on that right now. Philips is, is pushing that. Uh, and I think they're having the first um, basically intelligent LED conference is, is coming up here in about a month or two. So it's, it's only been in the, you know, it's at very early stage. So there's no protocols yet. Everybody's trying to figure out what's the best way to communicate back yeah. and then what's the best way to modulate the LED. So, still wide open. Anybody else want to comment on that? Okay. Very good. Steve, Kelly, Mike, and James, thank you very much for a very excellent presentation and discussion and being on time. And thank you for your good questions and your attention. <laughs> Appreciate it.